Hi, this is Misha, and this video is kind of something that's become a lot more of a topic on the internet in uh, recent years. I didn't used to see it much, but now it is. It is the German, or specifically Nazi German, MP44, or STG44, Stungewehr, and the Soviet Russian Kalashnikov AK-47. And the question is, and it's been really hotly debated, did Kalashnikov essentially rip off the MP44? Basically, did he take credit for the German designs? Did, did Russia not really make the AK as so much as copy the STG44 and actually used essentially imprisoned German engineers to design it? Or did Kalashnikov, as an engineer in Soviet Russia, pretty much designed the AK with only minor, minimum inspiration from other sources, including the MP44. Now, since I am in fact not 100 years old and was not there at the time, I can't speak to a lot of that, but I thought we would look at, uh, look at a couple of guns that will look at the features of each. This is my German-made, modern production German-made, of course, PTR-44 which is a really good part per part, part per part copy of the original STG-44. Actually, when I first had this come in to the shop, I also had a demilled STG-44 parts kit, including barrel and dewatered receiver. So I did a comparison, you know, just pulled out each part, like trigger pack to trigger pack, barrel to barrel, handguard to handguard and bolt to bolt and just kind of compared. I, I should have done a video on it, but that was several years ago and you know how it is. So anyway, I can, I can attest that this is a very faithful replica of the original. Definitely when it comes to mechanical functioning. So that's that. And for our AK today, we have a Russian AK-47 Type 3. This is my firing line receiver build using a PLL parts kit. This is not a matching kit, but it is an all milled correct AK-47. It's mostly Type 3, although it does actually have a Type 2 dust cover on it. I left it on because I think it looks cool. Why not? And it's really heavy duty. But this is a, a, the best I can do. I wish I had a Type 1, which would have been the original AK that was adopted in late 1947 and that had a combination stamped milled receiver but th those are incredibly hard to find and getting receivers for them is incredibly hard so this is what i have it should be close enough for today's purposes so are these really closely related did kalashnikov copy the stg to make the ak-47 or is this more or less an independent design let's look at it here We'll start with externals. I guess we'll just pan down. It'll be easier just to leave these on the table, I think. Both of them have a 16 and some change inch barrel. The AK would be chrome lined, the STG not. Both have a threaded muzzle with a muzzle cap only on each. The front sights, as you can see, are very similar. I mean, excuse me, the front sight bases, this is solid, this is hollow, but this does have a large protector. This just has a, you know, open top, smaller. Moving back to the gas blocks. Should I get this sling a little more out of the way for you? Sorry about that. Pretty similar, located in a pretty similar location. This one does have a stacking rod but no bayonet lug. This one has a bayonet lug, but no stacking rod. It also has a cleaning rod under the barrel, whereas the STG does not. This gas block is solid. You remove the gas tube to get to it. This gas block, actually the front unscrews, and the gas tube behind it to get to, and it does pull out. The two gas tubes are quite similar. They're both uh, fluted, made of metal. 
This does not really have an upper handguard. Its lower handguard is this stamped steel piece here that simply is held on by friction. It just pulls off. We'll get to disassembly in a bit. This in the other hand has traditional wood grips which come off with levers and, and whatnot. The rear sights are also quite similar. Very similar sliding ladder, ladder rear sight. It's kind of, there we go, thank you. They both feed from 30 round magazines. This one is ribbed. This one is solid. These are both early, this is an early AK mag to, to fit this. This fires 7.92 by 33 curves. And the Russian fires 7.62 by 39. Now it is worth noting that the original cartridge, which was tested in 1945 and 46, was different. It was a, um, the, the, the dimensions on the casing and bullet were different. Some people often call it the 7.62 by 41, although in Russia, they kind of just kept it all the same. On the receivers, as I said, the original AK-47 receiver designed by Kalashnikov would have a stamped housing here with machine trunnions here and here. But later guns would quickly switch with the Type 2 in 1949 to the milled receiver. On the STG, we have a stamped receiver with a machine trunnion in the front. Moving back, we both, of course, have triggers, <laughs> pistol grips, wooden butt stocks. This one has the trap door in the back and the butt plate. This one actually has the trap door in the top here. So, look pretty similar, don't they? I mean, as far as the, the features and whatnot. I mean, the design's a little different, but they look pretty similar. However, there's more to be considered. Now, I am not terribly proficient at disassembling on camera, so please bear with me. I've only done this a few times. Some of this mag stuck out. <laughs> Where to begin? I don't know. We'll scream at the mags. This is the mag catch. It is a push button here. Here, out of my way. Magwell here, push button. Whereas on the Kalashnikov, you have a, the paddle release we all know and love. Here, this is a rock and lock mag. As you saw, the STG is more of an AR style that just goes straight in and held in with the button. So the magazines, the way they go in, and the, mag, oops, the magwells are very different. At least, you know, one's rock and lock, one is straight in. What about the safeties and the fire mode? Well, the AK, we all know and love. <laughs> Up is safe. Obviously, this is a semi only, so we don't get... This would be semi, this would be full, but since it's a semi, we just have two positions. But this would be your selector. It also doubles as a dust cover. The MP44, STG44, on the other hand, your safety is here. Thumb style. Very familiar to you folks who are used to HKs. And the fire mode selector is actually here. Now this, is again, being a semi-auto, this is pinned to the single shot version. What's kind of neat about the uh, PTR44, this isn't cast into the frame. This is actually a movable piece. It's just pinned but there is actually the button with all the internals there. Kind of 
interesting to me. So we're starting to see some differences. Again, the hand guards. This uses a stamped steel. It's just held on, like I said, with friction. There we go. That's all it is. There's your barrel barrel. Your gas tube. That's it. There's nothing. It's just stamped. And it's, I mean, it's as basic as you can really get a hand guard to be. It works, though, although it gets very hot. <laughs> On the Kalashnikov is, you know. The upper hand guard is on the gas tube. It rotates off when you pull the gas tube off. And the lower hand guard's held on with this ferrule on the front that actually has a lever inside to rotate forward and take it off that way. So you have to disassemble. The butt stock is actually on the receiver here, held in on the mill with the top tang with one screw and the bottom tang with two screws. Let's go ahead and quickly disassemble this AK. I know most of you know it, but why not? Just to look at the internals. Press this back here. Recoil spring and guide here, self-contained. Bolt group. Now let's look at this bolt group for a sec. We have a long stroke gas piston. Charging handle on the right side. We have a two lug rotating bolt. And that's pretty much your guts of your AK. Gas tube just comes up like that and off. the barrel there. You can also see the, the inside of the gun here, the milled receiver, the trigger group. Let me let pretension off. Double hook. Very everyone pretty much is familiar with the AK AK trigger group. <laughs> so that's that. What about the STG? Well for one thing we definitely don't disassemble it the same way. <laughs> There's no top cover. Oh, I also forgot to mention there is a, uh, a dust cover here on the side if you cock it. Cock it real quick. You can see the dust cover flip up. The dust cover on the AK is also the safety. So how do we get this apart? Again, HK fans, we have a push pin. It's got a little spring loaded detent. Yeah. You just need to get the um, push pin out here. It's very familiar of HK. They fit very smoothly, but very tightly, which is good because you can see even with the pin out, this is sitting here. But to disassemble this gun, we just want to lay it and gently pry this off because once it starts to go, it's going to go. So yeah, let's get into disassembling the STG slash PT44. As you can see, the buttstock is very reminiscent of what we would know today is on the HK type guns. This is our recoil spring. It actually reminds me a lot of something you'd see in a World War II submachine gun. It fits in a hollow cavity in the stock here. This is why the uh, trap door for the cleaning supplies and tools is vertical, so there's room for the spring. Moving on to the gun, you see the lower comes down, much like on an HK. It is riveted into the receiver, so it's not removable, either on the PTR or the original. I mean, you can remove it for servicing, obviously, but it's not field removable. And here is our bolt group. When you pull it out, it, 
it literally just kind of falls apart because it's just held in together by friction. And what do I want to do now? Okay, so let's start looking at some parts. Let's compare bolt groups first off. This is, excuse me here, there's my bolt. The MP44 bolt compared to the AK bolt. Now the face is a bit similar. We have this large lug down here that pulls cartridges out of the magazine. because They're both double stack, double feed, magazine fed. We have a cut in the side for the ejector. We have a very standard extractor. And we have, of course, just a firing pin. <laughs> but once you get past the bolt face, the similarities start to end. The AK bolt tapers down to a very skinny stem, whereas you can see the STG bolt is very square and heavy. The AK bolt has two lugs for locking here and here with this third lug down here which really isn't a lug it's just a cartridge feeding device. This spins into the receiver to lock up and unlock and it actually uses this cam right here and it interfaces with its carrier, as most of you probably know. I, I bet a lot of you use AKs. It, this is when it would be pulling out, and then when it locks up, it actually turns and locks into the front trunnion. So this cam is what rotates it once the bolt carrier moves back and forth. The STG, on the other hand, this is its carrier. It, as you saw, it doesn't really lock in precisely. The carrier simply grabs the bolt. It actually has quite a large gap when it's moving. So it will come back, and then when the carrier comes back, it'll grab it and pull it out of the receiver. This is a tilting bolt, not a rotating or tipping bolt, if you will. It tips in and out to lock. And again, there's no real way to lock it to the carrier outside of the gun. Looking at the carriers themselves, we definitely can see some similarity, mostly with the pistons. Both use a fixed or pinned on long stroke gas piston. And these both have gas rings to seal up, although the AK is much more simplified than compared to the STG. We both have here fixed cocking handles. So I'm trying to show you. Very similar. Although one's on the left, one comes out on the right. <laughs> but once you get to the back, things get a little different. Here, the bolt. This comes out, your firing pin, your hammer hits your firing pin, boom, that's it, under the tail here. On the STG carrier, we have the bolt, and then we actually have a firing pin extension in here, and then a cutout back here to allow for the hammer to come up, and then a rear part for the spring to interface with. To me, this back part is very reminiscent of something you might see in something kind of like an AR-15 later on, but because of the cutout for the hammer. So there's that. The recoil springs, let's look at these. Do, do, do. I'll set that one much further over than I intended. <laughs> Very different. The recoil spring out of the 44 is very much like what you would see in a typical submachine gun of the era. Just a coil spring, and it resides in the buttstock. Whereas 
The AK is a captive spring on a two-piece rod. It actually telescopes. This is quite similar to what was in the earlier Russian STG-40. Excuse me, too many German things today. SVT-40 Tokarev, because it is a captive spring, and also the way it resides in the back of the receiver and does not go into the stock. This is an AK dust cover, obviously. This is a Type 2. This would, have been, this would have been the first type of cover used on the first milled guns. It is heavy gauged stamped steel. Very heavy gauged. And of course the STG doesn't really have anything. It's a solid bent over itself and welded together piece. So there's no cover per se and of course everything comes out the back. Looking at the trigger groups, it really seemed like a good idea to put the AAK over here at the time, but it's kind of being a pain. This is the AK trigger group, as most of you know. This is the original double hook pattern. Very simple, dependable. Obviously, this is a semi automatic group. A full auto would have a few more components. Though the original AK-47 design did not have what many call today a rate re reducer or an out-of-battery safety. That's really all that's in your AK for the trigger grip. You have a hammer, hammer spring. You have a trigger, a disconnector, and a little spring under the disconnector. And then two takedown, uh, two you know pivot pins for these to ride on. And some kind of retaining device. Since this is my semi-auto, I have a... Uh, trigger bow in here because I really like these plates. I hate the, uh, the little wires. They get bent out of shape, they wear out, they just suck. And this way I can easily get there for trigger maintenance or just for cleaning. Now let's compare that to the STG. I don't know that really much of anything is quite like the STG trigger group. It is definitely based on the same principles. Yeah. Hammer trigger but man is it a lot more complicated oh I can't pull that that's because we actually have an out of battery safety here which prevents the trigger from being pulled this is really difficult to do you need three hands there you go see now if I press it pull the trigger and the reason they can keep this on a semi-automatic is there's actually a second sear for full auto that would have been over on this side. If you look on the receiver, there's a cutout here for the out of battery safety. There would have been a second cutout here on the full auto. Just kind of a minutiae. We have the selector switch here internally. And yeah, this is just a pretty darn complicated trigger group especially for, for this era in guns. And that's pretty much the, the guts of this critter. There's nothing else inside this stamped receiver. It's a piece that's stamped and folded over and then it's welded. We have a trunnion in the front here where the everything kind of locks up into. You can't see it, but it's over here. Machine trunnion stuck into a stamped receiver. And that's about your only internals. The gas tube is empty. As I said earlier, this plug is removable. You see the hole to unscrew it. To get, you can unscrew this and then take your gas tube off and give your, um, you give your gas block a good cleaning as both ends are open. And that's about all there is to this gun. So yeah, we looked at the internals so much as they are for both of the guns. And now we'll put these back together and kind of get in a little bit to history and how this gun came to be. The MP44. Well, it really, the, the, the Germany had toyed with the idea of doing a um, kind of a reduced power, an intermediate power weapon since the 30s, but it just was not a priority. They really kind of got serious around 1938. 
but again it wasn't a high priority they were starting a war they um, they had other things going on they were very much in favor of using heavy heavy machine guns sorry this is the one tricky part about getting this thing of course in their video recorded last time I got it in perfectly there we go but anyway they, they very much relied heavily on uh, on machine guns and the rifle was only a support to the machine gun so it just wasn't a, a big deal. What really changed their mind was the invasion of invasion of Russia. In 1941, June, Operation Barbarossa, when they invaded, they had a lot of MGs. They also had most of the infantry equipped with the Carabiner 98K. And they had support troops armed with the MP38 and a few with the MP40 at that time. These went up against Russians who, you know, were armed a lot with the Mosin Nagant, of course, but a large number, at least a larger than in the German military, were equipped with automatic guns such as the SVT38 and the SVT40. Okay, this is just really tight. They also had quite a few submachine guns in service. They had the PPD series, which wasn't made in large numbers, but of course they're still in use. And they had the PPSH-41, which was just coming into the field. But because it was so cheap and easy to mass produce, they did field quite a few, and very quickly. And as Russians would retreat, more and more of these would come online. That's a story for another day. What this, hap what this did, though, for Germany, it was a wake-up call. And so they contracted in late 1941 with Walther and Hanel to design what we know today is an assault rifle. Back then, they really didn't know what to call it. They had just selected the 7.92 by 33 Kurs cartridge for further development and design. And they wanted Walther and Hanel to create a rifle to fire it. The rifle needed to be no heavier than the Car Carabiner 98K, preferably lighter. It needed to fire around 450, 500 rounds a minute in full auto and also be capable of semi-automatic fire. And it needed to be accurate out to at least 400 meters. There were other requirements, but you get the idea what they were shaping it up to be. It also needed to be shorter than the Carabiner 98. Walther and Hanel both worked. And in 1942, there was the MKB-42W from Walther and the MKB-42H from Hanel. Now, the design team at Hanel was led by Hugo Schmeiser, or Schmeiser who was pretty famous he worked on the MP-18 in World War I. He worked on its improved version, the MP-28, after the war, which is pretty commercially successful. He did not design the MP-38 or MP-40, although the magazine that they used was a patent of his. He did design the MP-41 submachine gun, which was produced in relatively small numbers and was not really adopted by much of anyone. It was sold commercially. But anyway, you get the idea. He had quite a few designs under his belt and he led the design team. They would test the MKB-42 series throughout 1942 and they had a lot of problems. It's worth noting that the handle design originally was from fired from an open bolt and was striker fired, although it did have a stamped receiver not too dissimilar to the later STGs. The Walther design had a more conventional receiver and it was hammer fired from a closed bolt. The handle design was doing better. They made a small number of prototypes in late 42 and sent them into the field for testing. And basically by 43, they decided to go with the MKB-42H, but they wanted some changes. They most importantly went from the open bolt striker system to the closed bolt hammer firing system that Walther used. And one of the earlier requirements was to have a bayonet lug and to have a grenade launching capability. In 1943, they would drop these from the designs. We'll get to that in a second. 
Another thing they would add in 43 would be this dust cover here. And the rail here would appear in 43. Eventually this would lead to the MP43 designation in early 1943. And also it would lead to a whole bunch of political stuff. First Hitler would suspend the program, then he would allow it to continue, but for testing and trial purposes only. He wasn't sure he, you know, and I'm not trying to defend Hitler, but his decision was, was not as idiotic as it sounded. You know, Germany was in the middle of the war, it was 1943, the Allies, America was there. They were already struggling to produce enough car 98s. They were working on the G41, G43 program. They had the MP40, and that's just small arms. They also had the P38, and they just had discontinued production of the Luger. So yeah, he was wary of getting a whole new cartridge and even type of gun into service. But he reluctantly kind of allowed the program to continue for evaluation purposes throughout 1943. Now the military itself had to kind of rethink what this gun was going to be too. Originally, they thought about it make, being a replacement for the, for the Mauser, the Car 98, but it, it didn't have the range. It wasn't really the right rifle launching platform and it was too short for a bayonet. On the other hand, it really wasn't small enough and light enough and cheap enough to replace the MP40. In the end, they ended up basically making it its own classification, which we know today as an assault rifle. So yeah, work would continue in designing the gun. The first uh, guns would start to see combat in 1943, around April to June, and they would mostly be used on the Eastern Front, but they were in pretty small numbers. You didn't see large deployment of the MP43 until the late part of that year, November, maybe October, but um, and not a whole lot were made at that point, 12,000 perhaps. But um, they would keep working on it, and by 1944, the MP44 designation would begin to, begin to be used in April, and then in October of the year, the STG44 designation would be used. There's no difference between the MP44 and the STG44. So yeah, they kind of had to find a place for it, and by that point, they were fighting a defensive war. So as the Allies encroached from the West and the Russians encroached from the East, the, the MP44 would be used in more of a defensive role. And it would go up against its old nemesis, the PPSH-41, and later guns that were coming out like the PPS-43 as well. So against machine guns, it did very well at longer ranges. But up close, the machine gun, because it was lighter and had a higher magazine capacity, still owned it. The problem that Germany was having at that point really wasn't with the gun itself, it was the logistics behind it. They just couldn't produce enough, fast enough, and they were having severe ammo shortages because this took its own unique cartridge. The, um, the MP44 actually is less resource, in, resource intensive to create than the Car 98. On the other hand, it requires more skilled labor and more importantly, more advanced and modernized tooling because of all the stamping. And that's where Hugo Schmazer really came in. He was really helpful in getting the stampings down right because of his experience with submachine guns. He also designed the magazine. Obviously though, he really led a whole design team and you can see some holdovers from this gun's original submachine gun origins such as the recoil spring and the buttstock. Another thing that a lot of submachine guns of the era featured was this hinge down trigger group. Uh, we'll look at one in just a second, but a lot of submachine guns used a separate upper and lower. The MP40 doesn't really have a hinge down, it rotates off, but the same idea. The original MP18 and MP28, the, the top would hinge out of the receiver, so you get the idea. The brake action style was, was pretty common for submachine guns, so you see a lot of vestigials left over. Because again, when this came out, they didn't really know if it was a rifle, a submachine gun, what it was. It was something truly new. And for that, Germany gets a lot. And so when they designed it, they still had to kind of figure out a, a role for it. But yeah, by 1945, when the war was over in April, May of that year, they had only produced about 425,000, not even quite that many. Not a large number. One reason that Hitler was reluctant to just send these out into the field as quick as he can could was because he did not want to send them out in small numbers where they couldn't make a difference. He wanted to equip entire divisions with these, which would have been very effective. But in the end, only one full division was equipped with these. 
and that was for the infantry. Um, specialists still were equipped with the Car 98 or G43. In fact, the G43 was officially declared the successor to the Car 98, not this gun. This was more of a replacement for either the MP40 or something to supplement it. So again, they had to create a role for it. So they didn't actually, they weren't able to turn out that many. And Hitler's decision wasn't completely lunatic because America made the same decision with the 1918 BAR in World War I. They could have deployed it earlier, but they did not want to. They wanted to deploy it in mass in the beginning. So it makes sense. So yeah, that was the, the war for this gun in brief nutshell. Hugo Schmeisser would um, be uh, a guest of the Allies, the Americans and the British intelligence, beginning around April of 1945. And they would, uh, they would release him in, uh, in June. And it, in July of that year, the Soviets would take over the area. Now, America could have taken him, like they did uh, Werner von Braun, but they looked at this gun and they didn't like it. They dismissed it. Both the British and Americans wrote reports basically calling this thing a piece of crap. They said it was easy to dent and damage, the range sucked, the accuracy sucked. We don't need this. We're not interested. So they really, they had, they had a chance and they just said no. So what about the Russian side of things? What about the AK-47? How did it come to be? Well, we have to talk about good old Mikhail Kalashnikov a little bit. There's a lot to be said about the gentleman. I, I find this story very interesting, but uh, as most know, he was born in 1919, and he was very much of a peasant Soviet stock. <laughs> in, uh, in his formative years, he actually worked at uh, various places after school. He uh, worked in the railroads before he was conscripted into the military in 1938, and he was essentially assigned to tanks. From there, he um, basically bugged his commanding officer in, about how everything worked and was trying to take everything apart. So, there's my little group. <laughs> A lot of Soviet officers of the era would have shut him down. He got lucky and had a good commanding officer that actually recommended him for an education. He received an armor certificate. And while earning his certificate, he actually designed a few things, including a new fuel gauge for tanks, a shell counter for how many shots were fired for tanks, and even uh, worked on a new track assembly. This... Uh, uh, basically granted him a promotion and he was uh, sent to Leningrad to the factory to be a supervisor and advisor and it actually earned the attention of uh, General Georgi Zukov. He even awarded him a small prize. I think it was a watch or something. <laughs> but he met the general and he knew him and so on and so forth. However, in 1941, when the Germans came, Mr. Kalashnikov was put back on the front line and saw heavy fighting. By this point, he was a uh, tank commander and a senior sergeant, and he worked on uh, T-34s. Kind of interesting. Definitely one of the best uh, Russian products early in the war. I'm going to put my mag. There we go. <laughs> so, he, he was in heavy combat through September. He was wounded in October in the shoulder and back from shrapnel and an exploding shell and he was in hospital. That's where this all kind of really gets its start. He, um, he was in hospital, in convalescence, and he talked with other soldiers who had been up against Germans and the heavy fighting, and you know, at this point it was pretty desperate days and they were in full retreat and all that. And, you know, he thought about designing a, uh, a rifle or a machine gun or something to help out fellow soldiers. And at the same time, he read what he could read in the hospital's library in their technical section. One of the books he read was written by Vladimir Fedorov. Now, Fedorov is interesting. He actually designed the Model 1916 automatic rifle in World War I, which some consider to be the first true assault rifle or battle rifle. 
At that time, there was, of course, no intermediate cartridge as we know it today, but he used 6.5 Japanese as it was the lightest full rifle round he could find. And uh, yeah, so Russia actually had fielded in small numbers, relatively small that is, a uh, automatic infantry rifle in World War One. And Kalashnikov read his book called, um, what was it, the, um, the Fundamentals of Small Arms, I believe. Or the, evo the evolution of small arms. There we go. He read it in the hospital. And so when he got discharged, he went back near his home to Alma Ata. And he would work on a submachine gun, actually, firing the 762-25 cartridge. This would be a closed bolt striker fired critter. And he would actually um, kind of just you know, work on it in, in tool sheds and shops and do this and that. He even submitted it for, uh, for a round of field trials in uh, 1942. But it lost out to Mr. Sudiev's PPS-42 at the time. This is, of course, a semi-automatic PPS-43, but the 42 looked quite similar. The reason I pulled this out now, even though Kalashnikov lost to a gun like this, is I wanted to illustrate this hinge down lower. Come on, there we go. Not uh, unlike that uh, STG-44, is it? Or any other machine gun of that era. These uh, Polish imports are really neat. Anyway, we have a whole video on submachine guns, but yeah. Kalashnikov's first design failed, but it did make it to the trial stage. But he was undeterred. He was still had six months leave at home to work. And so he um, continued working on his design. And he continued to impress people. He submitted another design in 1943. Again, it was looked at by a board. It was much better than his first, but it wasn't really superior to the, uh, the Sudiev PPS. So it did not go anywhere. But it did get him more attention, both politically and in the military. And he was transferred to uh, a design board. And he was actually put up with the, um, the Moscow Aviation Institute, which is also in Alma at the time. It's, it was relocated there because of the war. Good, uh, good fortune on him. And anyway, by 1944, he was w working with a small design team and, and kind of in there. He was also getting a more formalized education in engineering which was sponsored by a military general. But it's worth noting at this time, he was given some of the very new 760 by 41 millimeter intermediate cartridge. Now, I bring this up because a lot of people point to the, the 8 by 33's similarity with the 762 by 39 or 760 by 41 as it originally was. This isn't really relevant. Kalashnikov did not invent, it never it claimed to invent the 762x39-41 cartridge. And really, Germany adopting the 8x33 wasn't all that revolutionary either. America, after all, had adopted the 30 caliber carbine round, which while we classified as a pistol because of its round nose bullet, it was 762x33, so very similar in a lot of ways to the Kurs round, but just not quite powerful, not beefed up enough. But, you know, you get the idea. So he was given a, a test batch of the new cartridges to see what he could do with, as were several other people. The idea at the time, Russia wanted to create a series of guns firing the intermediate cartridge, including a bolt action, a self-loading carbine, a light machine gun, and a new version of the assault rifle, which is just coming into military theory at the time. And Kalashnikov was interested in the, uh, the, the, the assault rifle end of things. As a side, the bolt action never really went anywhere, and the self-loading carbine would be adopted as the SKS from Simonov. We have a video on the Tokarev and the Simonov. They would both enter into this competition. The light machine gun would be, become the RPD, firing the 762x41 cartridge, and it would be actually adopted in 1944. So, Russia would have a gun adopted in an intermediate cartridge before the war ended. In the end, Sudiev and Kalashnikov both submitted designs to the a round of trials in 1944, which would eventually lead to the Simonov SKS being adopted in 1945. 
the Kalashnikov did better than the Sudiev, but it was still a little too radical. It did have a fixed magazine, but that wasn't Kalashnikov's decision, that was Stalin's. And it used a two lug rotating bolt with a cam surface, not unlike, say, an M1 Garand or Carbine. So it had some early elements of what would be recognizable as Kalashnikov's design aesthetic at the time. But, um, yeah. He was definitely working on guns throughout World War II. While he was designing all of these weapons, he was actually fortunate enough to meet all the, the, the major arms designers, or most of them, in Russia at the time. Uh, he met Dityev, he met Sudiev, and he met Simonov. And in one of his memoirs, in one of his letters, he actually pointed out the fact that Simonov was very kind to him, that it's in his words, he treated him like a younger brother. I almost have to wonder if there's kind of a mentorship there because looking at some of the Simonov designs, if you look at the SKS, it resembles its gas system a heck of a lot like early Kalashnikov stuff. There's definitely some similarities right up to the captive uh, recoil system. Look at our SKS video if you want to see. We have a disassembly video of that. I think you might agree that the early Kalashnikov guns look a lot like the Simonov guns. And it's worth noting that in Soviet Russia at the time, because there weren't really any patents per se, just certificates of uh, authorship, th the government freely encouraged things to be copied. Anyway, moving forward. 1945, the war ends. Arms development kind of put, gets put on hold. But in 1946, there's another round of trials, uh, and uh, Kalashnikov wants to submit a gun. So he submits an advanced prototype again in 1946. It was put through a preliminary sand, dirt, mud test. It passed, and so it was officially uh, classed as the AK-46 by the uh, trials board, and it was put into the trials. Now, obviously, I don't have an AK-46. Wish I did. That'd be awesome. <laughs> but it was similar in a lot of ways and different in a lot of ways to the later AK-47. For one thing, the gas tube was smooth and much closer to the barrel. It actually reminds me more of what you would find on an SKS again. The gas piston was not connected to the bolt carrier, again more a la SKS or Tokarev SVT. So more or less a short stroke tap it system more than a, a long stroke. Still used the rotating bolt with two lugs. Had a heavier, beefier receiver. It had a separate fire mode selector and safety. And several other changes here and there. Now, that went through trials. It did pretty well. And Kalashnikov went back to the drawing board, revamped it, addressed some of the issues, and that's where the AK-47 comes from. This prototype was finalized around November of 1947 and would look very similar to this. We would start to see things like the ribbed gas tube, which is higher up. We would have the gas piston now connected to the bolt carrier. The non-reciprocating charging handle would be replaced with the fixed one to the bolt carrier and put on the right side. The separate fire mode and safety controls would be combined into one control here, which also doubled as a dust cover. The way the stock attached should be changed, and the receiver will be changed. The early AK-46 receiver had a hinge down frame here, not dissimilar to lots of other guns. The STG-44, for sure, but also the PPSH-41, the PPS-42, 43, so on and so forth. So the receiver, now this is, as I said at the beginning, a Type 3 milled. The original guns would have a stamped receiver shell in this same kind of uh, square shape without a top. And then it would have a machine trunnion for the barrel to screw into. And the trunnion and everything would be riveted and welded into place along with receiver rails. This worked, but at the time, Russia's production capacity... Well, it had issues. We'll get to that in a second. But that's basically a Kalashnikov in a nutshell. I think I'll write a blog article on the gentleman just to go into more of his detailed history because it's quite interesting. But um, I wanted to dismiss kind of the notion right off the top that he was just an illiterate peasant who knew nothing about guns. He started designing guns 
in World War II, and he had several failed guns before the AK, and he had several guns after the AK. Also, a formal education is not required. John Browning wasn't really highly educated, and look what he did. Uh, Mr. Hugo Schmazer was not heavily educated himself. He just learned through doing and practice in years. A lot of the best arms designers of that era didn't necessarily have a deep engineering or elite background. And uh, because of his work with tanks and other things, Kalashnikov was definitely around, around all things mechanical. And if he had mechanical aptitude from being a child, well, there it is. We'll move on. So, back to our original question, original purpose of this video. Did Kalashnikov copy, rip off the AK from either Germans or Schmeisser directly? Or, even beyond that, was Schmeisser the actual designer and Kalashnikov was just given credit that's what we're going to try to answer. When I started this video a couple of days ago, I just wanted to look at the guns and compare them. But as I research it more, look into it more, you know, there's some things just become clear. To begin with, it makes it hard to believe what the Soviet Union says. Historically, they've, they've lied. And they've used things for propaganda. And there's no doubt that Kalashnikov himself, in addition to his firearm, was a huge propaganda boost. He was a peasant. He um, was kind of the poster child for communism working in that nation. That was very fortunate for them. And they definitely lied about other things. I mean, just look at the Russian space program, if you want to look for a lot of cover-ups and kind of half-truths and things. So it's kind of, kind of hard to take what they say on face value, that he made it blah, blah, blah. But what we can look at are other guns from that period, some of them anyway. I only have a table so big. We can also look at things that Kalashnikov has said over the years. And keep in mind that he died over 20 years after the fall of communism. He died in 2009, uh, excuse me, 2013. So he had plenty of time if he wanted to get things off his chest. And at 94 when he passed away, he probably didn't have a whole lot left to, uh, to talk about. So, what happened? My assertion is that Kalashnikov was the primary designer of the AK and that he did not clone or copy the MP44 and that Schmacer had only some assistance with it and his designs had some influence. But, his design was not at all the only one to have influence on the Kalashnikov. Kalashnikov himself has said in, in years gone by that, you know, a, a gun designer before creating something new should look at what currently exists. If something works, if something exists, you're a fool to reinvent the wheel. And again, we're talking about Soviet Russia where patents aren't really a thing, kind of like China today. So I'm sure, undoubtedly, he looked at several other guns. In fact, he credited, in more than a couple of letters, uh, John Browning as an inspiration. First, for his notion of just having a standard-issue infantry rifle. Also keep in mind that the early Browning prototypes had detachable box mags. But you can really see this in the rotating bolt. Two lugs with a camway here, somewhat similar to, to an AK. But definitely I think this, because it was adopted in 1936 in the USA and was meant by the you know, 40s was very well known, had to have had some influence on Kalashnikov. Heck, the Japanese copied it whole cloth and the Germans even considered making a complete copy. Another gun that absolutely cannot be ignored is the Russian SVT-40. This was, for a time, supposed to replace the Mosin Nagant before World War II got in the way. This was designed by Tokarev. It does fire 7.62 by 
54R, but it fires it from a detachable curved box mag made of stamped slab side steel. Not whole, I mean it's definitely different, but it is a double stack, double feed mag. This has a gas piston under the barrel which taps the carrier, much like the early AK-46s and other early prototypes. But of course, the bolt system is pretty different. It's a tipping bolt, a tilting bolt. But the recoil spring in the back, on the other hand, is very similar to a Kalashnikov. So there's that. And just the whole notion of giving an infantry, every infantryman a semi or a full automatic weapon. It's also worth noting, while we're talking about copying, the early German G41 used the gas trap, the banging system, but it was not reliable. So when they designed the G43, they pretty much copied the gas system off the Russian Tokarev SVT-40 whole cloth. I mean, they're extremely similar in the principles the same and even the execution is extremely similar because they work. Now we have that uh, Sudiev PPS-43 again. I thought about bringing out the PPSH-41, but you know, you can look at that. But you get the idea for the hinging system here, the very simple bolt system. And most importantly, this shows stamping. The PPSH-41 and PPS-42-43 were built using, albeit simple, but still stamped receivers. So this shows that stamping was a technology in Russia as early as 1940-1941 to make guns. Again, albeit much simpler and not for locked breaches, and we're talking about open bolts of machine guns here. But this shows that they were making stamped guns with pistol grips curved mags. This is a, another double stat, double feed mag. Slab side, steel. And Kalashnikov made at least two different submachine gun patterns in the middle of the war. And of course we cannot ignore the Semenov SKS. Now, Semenov, this was not his first design. Actually, the AVS-36, Russia's very first automatic infantry rifle to be adopted, was also designed by Semenov. And this is kind of the final evolution of his whole program. The original AK-46 had a gas tube very much like this, smooth, close to the barrel, and with a uh, just a gas piston inside. Again, very similar to the Tokarev and others. But we do have a tipping bolt. On the other hand, we do have a captive recoil spring. I wish I had more table space. Let's do real quick here. Sorry, guys. Beep. I love the sound of machine steel. Here is its recoil spring. Pretty similar to the AKs. Now the, uh, the, the fixed mag, that was a Stalin thing. Uh, most of all of these designers originally were making guns with detachable mags. Stalin didn't like it, so by 1944 he was pretty much mandating that everyone make fixed mags because he thought it was a good idea. That's Stalin for you. And we still have a very similar pattern of rear sight. This is actually kind of copied over from the SVT-40, but for that matter. Very similar to both the STG and the AK. Front side is pretty similar as well. And now we're back to our two guns here. The STG. The elements that it's most similar to the AK in are really its gas system with this ribbed tube and the gas piston being a long stroke and fixed to the carrier with the gas rings. However, the original AK-46 did not have these elements. The AK-47 introduced them. It also does use a stamped receiver. 
but it's a very different style from what was appearing on the early AK-46s and 47s. Even the way the front trunnion attaches is very different, and we don't even have what would really be considered a rear trunnion. Trigger group's completely different. The magazine does look similar, but it is a push button release, not a rock and lock. It's a double stack, double feed curve, but we've seen this double stack, double feed curve many times. It's been used in many, many other guns. So even though it was a, a Schmazer design, lots of other people used it. Like I told you, this one fits tight, sorry. The original AK mags, as you see over here, weren't even ribbed like this. They were slab side. Controls, all that, completely different. Dust cover, completely different. Cocking handle, well, very similar, but then again, it's a cocking handle. It also looks the same as the one on the uh, SKS here. Very similar, actually. And the toke grab over here is the same. It just has a ring instead of that. So, I mean, a cocking handle is a cocking handle. I think, in the end, the STG greatly inspired Kalashnikov. No doubt, as soon as Russia captured a few of these, they sent a couple to their top advisor, oh, excuse me, their top designers, including Mikhail Kalashnikov and others. Keep in mind, these did not start to appear in any numbers until late 1943, and really not in large numbers in the final version from 1945. It is worth saying after that, that while um, the Allies had no interest in Schmeisser, Russia did. Originally, they interrogated him. Then they confiscated enough parts to build a few um, STG-44s themselves. They didn't make them, they just assembled them. The number is often quoted as 50. I couldn't verify, but you get the idea, a small number. They also confiscated uh, thousands of documents pertaining to the gun, so they were definitely interested in it. No question about it. Along with many other engineers, designers, and everything else, Smicer was invited to live in Russia in, in late 1945, and he actually was installed at the Ishevsk, which would later become Izhmash, factory around September or October of 1946. He was in a design team with other Germans. He was considered a senior designer, but he was not the team leader. So he was in a Russian factory by 1946, by towards the end of the year. But by this point, the original AK-46 Kalashnikov had already been tested or was going into testing. It had definitely been submitted for preliminaries. So it does not seem at all plausible that Kalashnikov had actually met Schmeiser before submitting his AK-46. That said, he probably definitely took a part in MP-44 and looked at it. And we're not really talking again about the cartridges because the, the 76239 cartridge was not the brainchild of Kalashnikov. That's irrelevant. Now, it's also worth noting that at that time, 1945 and early 46, Kalashnikov wasn't even at the Ishesk factory. He was, you know, he was quite a ways away from Schmeisser, who up until 1946 was still in Germany for that matter. And even after he came to Russia, he was not located in the same factory as Kalashnikov. But the AK-46 had issues. Good gun, but needed improvements. By this point, we do have Schmeisser, when we do have lots of MP44s in Russia. It seems clear to me that the gas system, both the tube and the piston, were pretty well lifted from the STG44. The magazine, that's harder to pin down. By this point, this style of mag had been used by so many people, who's no, who knows what was copied from where. We can say it was an original Schmeisser patent, sure, why not, but that by point, by that point, lots of people <laughs> were using it. <laughs> 
The original AK did use a stamped plus trunnion type receiver like the STG44, but it was a very, very different design as we've said, but they would also quickly go to the mill. They just could not get the stamping process down. The guns, when they actually made them were fine, but they had a high rejection rate. And this was at the Ish Hesk production facility, 1946, excuse me, 1948 and 49. So, by that time, Schmeisser was there. It would seem logical that he did help Russia try to get its stamping technology ironed out and was pretty unsuccessful because at the, in the end, they went to a milled receiver, which is much more time and resource intensive to make, but they knew how to do it because the SKS, the Tokarev, the Mosin Nagant all used milled receivers. So while they played with stamping, it seems like it was kind of a failed experiment back in the 40s, and Schmeiser very well could have been a part of that. Now, Kalashnikov denies that he ever really met the man, at least when he was still designing the gun. And by 1948, he wasn't really making the AK decisions much. By that point, it had already been accepted into service and committees had taken over its you know, final, final development. He was definitely an advisor, but... You know, that's how things worked in Russia at the time. So, a, again, the gas system, for sure. A few other small elements. But why do they look the same? That's easy. Form follows function, as uh, Ian at Forgotten Weapons has said, and many others. I mean, it's only logical. Why do all the self-loading rifles like the G43, Tokarev, M1 Grand look similar? Because they're all doing the same role. They're all set for the same ergonomics of humans. And of course, again, to be fair, I'm sure with Russian soldiers going up against the STG in combat in 1943 and 1944 and into 45, Kalashnikov thought, hey, you know, pistol grip. But again, having a pistol grip down here, a stock like this, this is not a new concept. They grew out of the same need, the same time period, and they had a lot of the same inspirations. Self-loading rifles of the day, machine guns of the day, submachine guns of the day. Now, is there any evidence? Did Schmeisser ever come out and say, hey, I made this gun? No. But he did die in 1953, so not a lot of time. He was asked, though, and all he said about helping the Russians was he gave them some small advice. He helped them with a few technical things. His Russian supervisor's reports said he was not that helpful. He wasn't a great problem solver, and he wasn't very cooperative. So there does, there's not any historical empirical evidence to say that he did it and he never claimed it. On the other hand, Kalashnikov said that he did not get any help from Schmeisser when designing the gun. He did say, of course, that the Germans' deployment of the MP44 did inspire him, but he did not say he, you know, he definitely said he made it. And he pointed out, of course, the form over function thing and, and just the design concepts. And he also pointed out the mechanical differences, how his gun is much more simplified, dependable, reliable, much looser tolerances than the MP. He also pointed out that, you know, he wanted to make this because he was an infantry soldier. He was a tanker. He was there. And so he, that's what kind of showed him what a soldier needed. Simple, dependable, reliable. And then, of course, Russia liked it because it was pretty easy to produce, too. So Kalashnikov says that Schmeisser didn't make it. Schmeisser never said he did. Everything else is speculation. We have no historical evidence to suggest that Schmeisser made this gun. And when you do scientific research and historical research, you have to go with evidence. The burden of proof is on the person making the claim, and there's just the evidence saying that this gun was copied to make this gun and that the designer of this gun actually made this gun in secret, it's all circumstantial. That's all I can conclude. I could not find any really good hardcore evidence aside from the very obvious stuff, again, like form over function. They are select fire gas operated guns. So I figure, you know, after the AK-46 was adopted, they said, hey, this STG's got a great gas system. It'll probably be simpler and more reliable to put it in your gun. Let's do it. So they did it. Which is kind of only, again, just dessert, since Germany did the exact same thing when making the G43. They just 
took the gas system right out of the Tokarev. So, you know, tit for tat, I guess. Now, again, I do admit, because of being Soviet Russia, it's kind of all murky. And this is just my look. You can draw your own conclusions. I'm not saying I am right. I'm not saying that this is 100% proof. All I'm saying is I couldn't find any really good evidence to support the German connection claims and the MP44 claims, aside from, of course, inspiration, which I don't think anyone with the common sense would deny. And before we leave, Kalashnikov was not stingy about saying who helped him. He credited several other Russians. He credited his own wife. He credited, he credited uh, John Garand. And things like the trigger group are very obviously a kind of a simplification of a branding trigger group. Heck, even this dust cover, it's like on a Remington Model 8. If you look at a Remington Model 8, really this whole shape kind of top cover shape is kind of that way. So it's definitely not something that Kalashnikov just woke up with and made it out of nothing. But he took inspiration from the guns of the day, of the day that worked, including the STG-44 and the Grand and the Tokarev and the Simonov and tons of machine guns and everything else. So, you know, he did the best. In the end, he mixed it all together and kind of made his own gun. Most folks who knew him said he was a very humble man and nice man. He definitely didn't profit monetarily from it much. He did what he did. In the end, with a lot of stuff in history, sometimes we just don't know the whole truth and maybe never will. But, um, you know, I just wanted to look at the two guns and compare them. A little video turned into a big video, but I found it really fun to, to do this research. I hope you enjoyed it. Even if you I hope you enjoyed it, even if you had to watch it in a couple of parts, but I wanted to be thorough because I got into it and I found it really interesting. And I like both of these guns. So, yeah. Hope that helped a little bit. That's just kind of my two cents and what I've uncovered. Oh, and the whole thing about the AK's design still being classified in Russia. Uh, look into how Russian government classification systems work. It's not the same as America, so it's really not too surprising. But, um, yeah, if you have any questions or comments, we really would like you to post them below. I know this is kind of a hot-button topic now, so let's keep it pretty civil. I'd really ask that, please. And, you know, just, you know, discussion. I'd love to hear you write, you know, any evidence you've come up with one way or the other. But let's just keep it friendly, if you could, please. That'd be, that'd be awesome. We'd like to keep our comments uh, that way. Really appreciate you tuning in. And please tune in again next time for more hopefully interesting videos. We'll catch you then.